Hey guys, I know you got a ton of questions when it comes to coronavirus or COVID-19. So what I've done here tonight is create a Facebook Live Q&A event where you and the general public can ask the questions that you have and get the answers that you need. So tonight, uh, my friend and I, Dr. Megan Williams, will sit here and try to answer them the best we can. So here we go. What's up, San Antonio and world? I'm Dr. Kasim Bhatt, and I'm a kidney doctor, and I'm here to break down health in a simple way. Today is a great episode. It's a great episode for Facebook Live. What we're doing today is we're doing a Q&A about coronavirus, COVID-19. I'm sure y'all are interested. I'm here with my girl, Dr. Megan Williams. Say what's up. Hi, guys. So we're going to be talking about COVID-19. And again, this is all about you guys. This is all about you. So you got to do me a favor right now. you got to hit up that like and share button so I can see you. So like me right now so I can see you. Also, if you know anyone that could benefit from coronavirus, a lecture about coronavirus, which is like everyone at this point, please tag them on the comment section so they can get it, get notice as well, notice of it as well. And we're going to talk to my, my, my friend here, Dr. Megan Williams. Dr. Megan Williams, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, guys. My name is Dr. Megan Williams. Um, board certified in family medicine, um, but really what I'm, I specialize in is just getting people healthier. So um, yeah, super excited to share some good information today. Great, great. What got you interested in COVID-19 and coronavirus? I mean, we're all affected by it, but what, what in particular got you involved in it? Sure. So, so even though I'm board certified in family medicine, I work in emergency medicine, so I work in case and ERs, mm -hmm. and so we're, we're the front line right now seeing the, the effects on the community. Yeah. So. But you honestly have gone above and beyond because you create a website called www.covidsa.com. Mm -hmm. It's right above her head on the, on the right side of your screen. Um, tell them, tell them about that website. Oh, right here, right, <laughs> right there. Yeah. So, so really, the purpose of this it was a, a medical school classmate and I. We, we started it. It was really just to inform people. Um, for a short while, we were able to do testing, not doing testing currently, but point being inform and and, and really support the, the San Antonio community. Yeah. And when you look at the website, if you go to www.covidsa, you can really see it's a very beautifully set up website. Gives you good information, some basic information about it. But she's gonna be constantly updating it. So if you guys have a chance, please check it out, okay? Um, so we want to go ahead and get started. If you guys have questions right now, please go ahead and uh, send, send them uh, our way. Um, as far as uh, corona, uh, coronavirus, let's just go over what is coronavirus exactly? Yeah, so the coronavirus, um, you know, just like you learn in medical school, it's, it's typically a common cold, right? Yeah. But corona or COVID-19, uh, um, the co from corona, um, but B mean virus and then D mean disease, um, it is a, is a novel virus, meaning that it's a new type of coronavirus. Yeah. Um, so um, more virulent than a typical coronavirus, um, the common cold. Absolutely, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, and so for that reason, because it's, it's far more contagious, the R-naught is, is extremely, the likelihood of it being transmitted between people is so much higher. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's what COVID and is. And guys, I really want you all to understand that the reason why COVID-19 is so such a problem is that it's so contagious, mm -hmm. that it spreads so easily from one person to the next. And oftentimes, you don't even have to be symptomatic. And a lot of these people are what we call asymptomatic. They have no symptoms. They feel fine. But they're still shedding virus, okay? So um, let's see here. We got, a, we got a question for Javier Barreras. Javier Barreras, thank you. How are you handling COVID-19 cases while on HD? Are you doing a sick HD center? Great, great question. Great question. I happen to be a nephrologist. <laughs> so, that, so um, as far as dialysis patients, so you have, if you're a COVID-19 patient and you're relatively stable, you got to remember COVID-19 patients, most, most of the symptoms are mild. So that's the case for a lot of dialysis patients as well. So if their symptoms are mild for a dialysis patient, a dialysis, um, a dialysis center will typically, some dialysis chains actually have one dialysis center set up for COVID-19 19 patients. Other than that, if they don't have that set up, um, what they can do is have you come in on a certain shift, a certain time of day, and will they'll isolate you there. Oftentimes in those dialysis centers, you have isolation rooms, right? You have isolation rooms, so you can actually put someone in an isolation room. Now, if it gets too much, too many people that have COVID-19, they'll actually separate them out, keep them farther. Also, dialysis units right now, they're on lockdown. So when you come to a dialysis unit, guess what? They're taking you, they're, uh, they're giving you a mask right away. They're talking to you about your history, how, how you're doing, any fevers, chills, sore throat, any of those kind of things, and making sure you don't have it. Then you have a fat mask on, a surgical mask, and you're wearing that the whole time. All staff is wearing masks as well, too. 
Javier, does that answer your question now? Let me know. So Minnie Morales, her question is, why won't they test people who are symptomatic but don't fit the criteria 65 and above? So Minnie, it's a, that's a really good question and it's something that, that hopefully is fast evolving. Um, basically, it's a shortage of tests. So we can only test so many people and so the priority was placed on people that, that would be most impacted. Um, but once again, and there was actually a meeting just before this with the Bear County um, uh, Health District that they're actually liberalizing that a bit to definitely include um, healthcare workers, um, household contact. So point being is that originally it was just for symptomatic people because of shortage of tests and as tests become more available, the criteria will be more liberal. Okay, good, good. Exactly. And that's the big, biggest limitation right now. It's just not the availability of the test. So otherwise they would probably screen a lot more, mm -hmm. but the tests are just not available. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here, Mary Maza Gambon Gamboni, worried about my son who has had two kidney transplants. What would happen if he gets the virus? Okay, so the thing with kidney, people with kidney transplants, right? If people have kidney transplants, they're on immunosuppressive therapy, right? They're on medications that suppress their immune system so they don't reject their kidneys. Now that's great so that they don't reject the kidneys, but it also decreases their immune system. So when they get a virus, it can actually be more serious. Now, uh, what I would do is if, if I was that person uh, or, the, or the, the mother of that person, I would keep that person indoors at all times. If they're going out, they should probably have a surgical mask or something on their face to cover, cover themselves up to protect themselves. Now I've actually talked to the two transplant centers here, University Transplant and Methodist Transplant about their criteria and what they expect for their transplant patients. Also, if you ha monitor for fevers, monitor for the symptoms, they should have all those symptoms as well, just like a regular person. And if you have that, you can call your transplant center, update them, or even call your primary doctor to verify that, okay? Um, but in general, right now, they're still recommending you stay on all your immunosuppressive medication. Don't decrease your medication. You just have to be extra cautious. You are one of those that's more at risk of getting it, okay? And having worse outcomes with it, okay? Um, let's see here. Okay, so what we got here? We got a Norma Castillo. Hi, uh, thanks for your time. I have RA. Rheumatoid arthritis? Is that what you're saying? I, <laughs> I would so. think so, right? Yeah. Rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis, that, everything I just said about um, people uh, on transplant, that pretty much fits your criteria as well. You're on probably an, an immuno, immunosuppressive medication that's suppressing your immune system. You got to be just as cautious as someone with a transplant. So you got to make sure you do not go outside, wash your hands, all the all the preventative stuff we talked about. Again, uh, you may want to actually, you may be one of those that when it goes outside, you definitely cover your face with a mask as well too, okay? Um, let's see, let me see. Uh, anybody else? Oh, can I join early job? Oh, Prem, you joined You joined in time, Prem. Prem is a dialysis nurse. Uh, Prem, uh, Prem Strip, I know her well, great girl. You got a question, let me know for Prem, okay? Um, let's see here. Uh, what? Yes, so not so many questions, guys. Um, I guess really let's kind of, I guess thinking about things that I think are important for people to understand. Um, if we can just kind of talk, we can just kind of talk about things that, that, that are important to understand about the disease. And I want you guys to feel free to jump in with any questions um, as, as we kind of discuss this. But in my opinion, it's important to understand um, the way the disease is, is spread. Mm -hmm. um, so the the main spread is going to be through respiratory droplets. Yeah, yeah. Um, there there are some studies that show that perhaps that the the little particle viral particles will will remain in the air for three to four hours. Um, but yeah, it's respiratory droplets, and so the big deal with that is you know not rocket science. Wash your hands. Yeah. Make sure that that um, you know coughing into the angle of your uh, of your arm. Um, so. And social distancing, obviously, social distancing. six feet apart, just See, like we are. Yep, we, like measured, we measured, we measured, y'all. We yep, measured. They're good. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. And super, super important with the social distancing. Um, well, and I guess really on my page, I'll post later. Um, there's a really good, good infographic that kind of looks at the power of uh, of social distancing, um, and it's 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 a real kind of visual reminder that yeah, it does make a difference. You know, mm -hmm. maintaining that space. Okay. Cool. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Doctor, at the clinic four, we have one bay. This is safe. Let me see here. I'm getting so many pop-ups right now. Give me a second here. Prem, you got a question. At the clinic four, we have one bay. This is safe for our patients because we, we don't know who has COVID or not. So, okay. Okay. So you, yes, distance should be safe. They say, they say keep the, the dialysis machine and dialysis patient six feet away from the other, other patients if they have COVID. Okay. Also, if they have COVID, they have to cover their mouth, ma mouth, and the policy in a lot of dialysis units is 
the 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 patients the the not not the patients but the nurse and the, the techs that are taking care of that dialysis patient are going to wear N95 masks. So if you have a COVID patient in your unit, they will have to the the people that are treating them directly, the nurse and the tech, will have to wear an N95 mask. Okay. So question: uh, some easy food and drink recipes um, during this time for patients and not patients when you're running out of food from the grocery store and stuff that you have. Um, I can't really address. I want to address things that are good for the immune system. So mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, because uh, what's great about Megan here, all about wellness, all about wellness and health. So that that means she knows what she's talking about. Go, go ahead. Yeah. So vitamin C, guys, super important. Um, there's actually some evidence for anti-inflammatory effects of vitamin C, um, and so particular patients, even when they're in the, the ICU with lung inflammation, vitamin C can be helpful. Yeah. Um, but point being, um, things that are rich in vitamin C, strawberries, um, oranges. Um, would be good good choices. Um, what about vitamin D? Do you are you big on vitamin yeah, D as well? Yeah. So too? the vitamin D, there was actually a study that I read that was looking at um, a study that I read that was looking at vitamin D. So ICU patients yeah. with COVID had lower levels of vitamin D. So correlational, causational, who's to say? But point being is that yes, supplementation of vitamin D. Um, recommendations for that is a thousand um, units uh, per day for females. Okay. Um, so yes. And take with D, food. Yes, with food. Vitamin D, if you are on vitamin D or multivitamin, it's always better to take with food because it absorbs better. Go Absolutely. Ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, other things, the uh, other things, red bell peppers, super high in, um, in uh, vitamin C as well. Um, broccoli, antioxidants, um, really, really important because antioxidants can, can also help um, kind of with the immune system. There's studies looking at zinc and so really can, I, can, I, can I ask you something? All these things that you're talking about, mm -hmm. are they good in the acute setting or more chronic? Meaning, meaning you've been taking it for a while. So I'm all about health and nutrition as well as she is. What I'm trying to wonder is, is, is popping up your immune system going to happen when you're just taking vitamin C or vitamin D all of a sudden? Or is it when you're taking it over a long period of time, eating right, exercising the whole nine? Go ahead. It's a really, really good question because I think that we can be kind of reactionary in the States, you know, we want kind of to take that, that vitamin and, and be done with it. But no, it, it has to be done in the context of kind of longitudinal investment in health. Yeah. And what I'm really hoping for everybody out there, guys, this is really an opportunity to understand the importance of having a good, healthy foundation. So making sure that you're getting these supplements, making sure that you're eating a balanced diet before things like this happen so that your baseline health is, is, is solid. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, total overall health is very crucial here. Abby Haran asked a very good question. Should healthy adults be worried? Based off news, young adults with no coronaries were, sick, were getting very sick as well. Now, this does happen, but the data I've seen for the most part, the people that get the sickest are the older, older population and people with comorbidities. Now, honestly, we're living in San Antonio right now, right? So a, a lot of our younger populations, 30s and 40s, they think they may be healthy, but oftentimes they're obese. Mm -hmm. They're overweight. Um, they don't exercise. And so obesity in itself is a comorbidity. And so if I was a 45 year old who never sees a doctor and, and is obese or overweight, I would be concerned to be honest with you. So this is where you have to take this disease really seriously. Just because you're 40, 35, you think you're gonna, you're gonna be okay. Uh, now, as far as in Cincinnati, yeah, there are some young people affected as well, but I think for the most part, right, it's the older and comorbidities that are the ones that get you. Absolutely, so as we look at the statistics, you know, um, for death or for, for mortality, 15% of patients greater than the age of 80 um, will, will pass away from this. But when you get less than 40, it's 0.5%. So the mortality, uh, mortality rate, and I'm sorry, less than 50, the mortality rate is 0.5 or lower. So really, okay. the, the people that are really going to be adversely impacted on the whole are going to be patients that are older. Yeah, absolutely. And you should always be looking out for not just yourself. I mean, you have to look out for your grandparents and all that. Stuff. That's mm -hmm. why washing your hands, social distancing is kind of crucial. It may be not the best time to visit grandma right now. Right. You may want to just FaceTime. Okay. Okay, mom, I know you're watching. <laughs> and, but yeah. And guys, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, I wrote a, a little blog on this. Um, it's not for you. It's, it's, it's not for the, the healthy young person. Yeah. It's looking out for your, for your Nana and for your Tia and for, you know, whoever else that you love that will be affected. So Absolutely. Super important. Absolutely. Uh, let's see here. Minnie Morales. Hey, Minnie. How's it going? How's it going? Great, uh, great nurse, I know. I don't even, haven't seen you in forever, but so why is hydroxychloroquine being used to treat it? And do you think other medications will become effective too? So uh, the data is kind of, that's kind of mixed on it, um, but I think it's working to some degree. Some mm -hmm. anecdotal evidence that it's working. Right. So 
I've heard in the inpatient setting for sick patients, yes. they're implementing hydroxychloroquine mm -hmm. and uh, azithromycin as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they're just trying it out. Guys, what you have to understand right now, this is a very fluid situation. This is a very dynamic situation. So we're really just kind of doing stuff on the fly. So medicine is typically what we call evidence-based, right? It's evidence-based. But right now, a lot of it's opinion-based. That opinion is from very intelligent people, but we're kind of just going along and trying to figure it out as we go. Right. So as of right now, the very sick patients in the ICUs and in the hospitals, they're trying out the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin as well, too. And just to point on that, guys, um, the pharmacies now, because there was a bit of a run, there was announcement, a public announcement made about the efficacy of this medication. And oh, so yeah. there was a big run on Plaquenil. Um, now what the pharmacies are doing is that, is that if you don't have a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, they're saying you can't prescribe it, which is appropriate. Yeah. It's the inpatient news guys that there's the strongest evidence that this helps. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is azithromycin. I know patients are probably like, oh, it's a, it's an antibiotic. Why does it work? Um, the evidence really is, 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 is indicating that it probably is an anti-inflammatory inflammatory component, yes. And yes. not so much the antimicrobial effects. Yeah, absolutely. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And guys, if you're watching right now, do me a favor, hit up that like button so we can see you right now. Let us know you're out there. So hit up that like button and share it as well, okay? Um, there was a question about the Abbott machine. Um, so Abbott so, machine? Go yeah. Ahead. Go so ahead. Abbott is, is point of care testing, five minutes. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, five minutes rapid testing. Um, so that is supposed to um, be, be a reality um, soon. I know actually personally um, one of my friends um, is, is trying to get that in the city, but point being is that these are things that are on the horizon. Um, it would be a great thing to have, but these are things that are still in the work. So I hope that answered your question. I saw that a little while ago, but yes, um, there's places right now in the city that are actively working to get the Abbott machine. Okay. My husband is requiring to go to elderly. Okay, let's see here. Sonia Medina Cantu. My oh, yeah, my girl, my girl. Oh, it's your girl. Oh, it's your girl. <laughs> Go ahead, answer it then. Go ahead. What was the question? <laughs> my husband, so how this? My husband is required to go to elderly retirement homes for computer printer support. Would you recommend masks or gloves, even though they are not near patients' residence? Interesting question. Yeah. So, guys, one thought that I have about the gloves is that um, if you're wearing gloves consistently, you're actually putting yourself more at risk of self inoculation. Reason being is that within the, the hospital setting, we put a pair of gloves on, we see a patient, we take it off. If you're walking around touching everything and then you touch your face, well, you just contacted it, right? Yeah. And so the thing that I'd recommend uh, for Ray Raymond is, is that he needs to wash his hands consistently throughout the day. A mask may not be a bad idea. Um, and with that, though, the guidelines for CDC still are saying that they don't recommend surgical leave masks, right? They're yeah. Saying, yeah. So, They're not saying that, yeah. So point being, with that, Sonia, the bigger thing um, is to make sure that he's maintaining that, that, that distancing of the patients. It doesn't sound like he's in direct patient care, um, but yeah, making sure that he's washing his hands. If he has access to gloves that he can change as he's moving through different, um, different workstations, then that could be an option. But and, walking around with gloves is And not honestly, good. that is a big concern. So um, when you're in the medical community, community, you know to change the gloves. But we I actually had some uh, 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 colleagues of mine, they, they went to a, a restaurant, I'm not going to name the restaurant, but the, lady, the girl that was cleaning the counters was using the same gloves to eat her lunch. Yeah. So unfortunately, people in the medical community just don't realize that you have to constantly change your gloves in there. The other thing about washing hands, y'all need to know, washing hands is not just a quick little washing of hands. It's taking soap. And actually washing your hands, back your hands, in between your fingers for 20 seconds thoroughly. Soap Wa is best. Soap is best. Mm -hmm. So if soap is not available, then you can use alcohol, which is like 60% uh, rubbing alcohol. Not rubbing alcohol. Excuse me. Uh, you know, oh. alcohol. Alcohol, yeah. like a soap. But 60%, okay? But soap and, soap and water is the most effective, okay? Uh, a Prem asked me a question. Can you same HD machine to COVID and non-COVID? That is a very interesting question. Um, you know, honestly, I, I, was, I was reading over the criteria today over um, dialysis. I am not sure about that. I think you can, but I think if there's a dedicated unit or a dedicated station for it, you probably want to use the same machine, I would guess. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Let's, let's... So there was a good question I wanted to address on, oh, evidence for patients having s symptoms, testing positive and getting um, over the virus and becoming reinfected. So really good question, um, Ray. Um, so there's, there's cases, there's, there have been cases of this occurring, but really what we're seeing is that there's IG, IgG and IgM um, levels in the, in the serology when we take blood out from patients 
that they have IgM and IgG, which suggests that they have immunity to uh, the virus. And so the answer from what we know right now is that, yes, I mean, the, the probability of being, becoming reinfected again is very low. Um, my guess would be is that those negative and then positives are more likely than not false negatives. Okay. So, yeah. and it's interesting because they just discussed that in the Bear County um, Health Department call. Okay. Um, but yeah, the probability is very low of reinfection. Cool. So that's, according to what we know thus far, that's, that's, that's the case. Norma, Norma Castillo, how true is drinking hot liquid will kill the virus? Norma, that is not true, okay? But what I've noticed on social media is there's a lot of Facebook memes going out about, um, about uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus. You have to be careful where you get the sources, okay? You gotta trust doctors or people that know what they're talking about. So drinking hot liquid may be kind of an old, old wives tale, mm -hmm. but I would not use that as a preventative measure, but I appreciate the question, okay? So I want you to answer this one, Dr. Brett. So Javier Barajas, ACE and ibuprofen theories regarding prognosis, poor prognosis, what are you doing and recommending to your patients? As far as ACE, ACE inhibitors? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are certain medications out there, guys, or blood pressure medications called ACEs and ARB, the ACE inhibitors and ARBs, those are typically your lisinopril's, enalapril's, low sardins, vol sardins, okay? These are very good medications, not only for your kidneys, but for blood pressure and your heart, okay? Now, the coronavirus is very interesting. When it gets into your cells, it's actually using uh, a particular enzyme that has a receptor, it's called the ACE2, okay? In theory, these medications, the ACE inhibitors and the, the, uh, the, the ARBs, they can possibly increase the levels of those ACE2s, okay, in theory. But I've actually looked this up today in New England Journal of Medicine and on, um, and on uh, uh, American Heart Association guidelines and all this other stuff. They are not recommending anyone stop those medications, okay, particularly if you have heart conditions. And the reason why is those medications are actually helping your heart condition. And if you stop them suddenly, you can have a decompensation of your heart function, okay? So do not stop those. What was the last one you said? Uh, 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 NSAIDs. NSAIDs, okay. So the, uh, you, can, you, you can comment just to, uh, this as well. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, the data came out of uh, uh, France, I guess French, French Ministry of mm -hmm. Health, where they came out against NSAIDs. NSAIDs are your ibuprofen, your uh, Aleve, aspirin, um, those kind of medications, okay? Now, uh, the people oftentimes take them for muscle aches and fever reducing. So there's, there was some a, some anecdotal evidence out of uh, out of France saying they're recommending not taking it because it can make the virus work because they think those medications can actually suppress your immune system and suppress your ability to fight the infection. Um, what I read on the FDA today was that no, that's not necessarily the case. No one has come out completely against it. Um, but if you're worried about something like that, you can always take Tylenol. So Tylenol for fever reduction is just as effective, so you can try that instead, okay? But again, it's inconclusive right now. FDA doesn't agree with it. The uh, French ministry does, okay? Uh, let's see here. Oh, Ronnie Bear, let's see here. Ronnie Bear Barend, okay. Are homemade masks safe for immuno immunocompromised patients if we cannot find masks at our local pharmacies or stores? Okay, so homemade masks are better than nothing, okay? So what I've read is a homemade mask is anywhere from, oh, what is it, 30% to 50% effective as a surgical mask. By the way, guess what, guys? I got, I got the two here, okay? So I got the mask here. I got you a surgical mask. This is a surgical mask, okay? This is actually a surgical mask, okay? And um, the way, uh, this is the cloth mask, uh, not cloth mask, it's a surgical mask properly used in, in, for, for healthcare professionals. This one is an N95 mask. N95 is more fitted around the mouth. It's more fitted around the mouth, okay? This is extremely, this is just for medical professionals. This is pretty much for medical professionals as well. Now, um, cloth masks are, are, are only partially as effective as this, 20, uh, 30 to 50 percent. Now the thing is, if you are someone that is immunocompromised, I would probably take the cloth mask over anything. Mm -hmm. First off, I would definitely stay home. Right. You gotta just stay home. Mm -hmm. If that's wash your hands all the time, the, the, the whole nine that we talked about. Now, if that's not if that's not the case, uh, if that can't be the case, you have to go out and use a cloth mask. If not, if you can get a surgical mask, it'd be great. Okay, a surgical mask, not the N95. No one should be using N95 except for healthcare professionals. Surgical masks are pretty much for healthcare professionals as well too. Maybe the immunocompromised should have them as well, too, if they absolutely need them, okay? Let's so see. there was a question about, um, I didn't even know this. I think this was from Yenny again, but apparently in Michigan, they're giving first responders 
uh, Paquino, I'm sorry, Esme Escobedo, she's saying that um, they're giving Paquino the first responders as preventative me measures against the acquiring virus. So guys, the deal with Paquino, a couple of things that I wanna say. So first and foremost, there's always that, that person that has a misunderstanding. There's an ingredient in a particular type of, of, of fish um, tank um, conditioner that uh, has a similar name. Don't go home. Don't try to make it at home. Somebody actually did that. In, in really? Dad. Yeah. Wow. So that's the first thing. But the other thing with this is that there's there's studies in the work. There's actually a CDC study that they're doing a call right now looking at whether or not patients that are already on Papua whether they're less likely to end up with, um, with COVID. Now, with that being said, the early evidence is that no, it doesn't make a, a difference. And so what I would say is it, it's surprising that, that Michigan is actually starting to do that because I don't think that the evidence is strong enough to, to justify something like that. And the other problem with everyone using Plaquenil, there becomes a shortage for the people that really need it. Amen. Those people that are, have rheumatoid arthritis, that have people have lupus, that need the Plaquenil for life, um, there, there's actually shortages of it for them. Now, I'm not saying we should, if it, there's evidence to use it, we should use it. Right. But it's really shaky right now. So I think for the most part, if you're inpatient in the hospital, really sick, you're sick as a dog, they'll try it out on you. But right. I'm not sure in the outpatient setting, you should be taking it, okay? And other reasons with that, guys, you know, um, Q-Wave, uh, it, it can cause heart arrhythmias. Um, nothing is really benign. You put a chemical in your body and, and you're running the risk of having issues. So, so yeah, Plaquenil, leave it. Um, I, I think it's inpatient is the more appropriate place for it to be. Okay. Ray Gutierrez, what's up, Ray? What's up, man? Uh, he's got three little girls just like me. Well, you got three or two? three. Yeah. <laughs> what is the evidence of any of our of, of patients having symptoms? What is it? What is the evidence of any of patients having systems Symptoms, testing positive, getting over the virus, and then becoming reinfected. Oh, I already answered that. There are rumors. Oh, you did answer yeah, that. Yeah, I did answer that. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. no. Uh, um, let's see. Pram. Oh, Pram, you got a bunch of questions. Let me see. I'm in a cute area. I do not want to. Is it, I do want to know how to be safe for myself and my patients. I'm in a cute area. So if you're in a cute, a cute, like you were talking about in the hospital. So um, at this point, again, the social distancing thing is big. We're not. You're a nurse. So as a doctor, what's interesting is, and especially as a consultant, I'm allowed to, like the, a lot of the hospitals have policies where I don't have to touch the patients anymore. So you, yeah, so they're saying the consultants don't have to. The hospitalists and ER doctors, they still do. So I get to avoid that. As a, yeah, it's great, right? Um, Pram, uh, you, as a, you definitely need to be wearing a mask. If you're in an acute area, like in the hospital, mm -hmm. a lot of these hospitals, they all come around to everyone wearing surgical masks in the hospital. So that's, that's going to be the big thing. Washing hands, of course, that's a big thing as well. But I'm definitely going to say you're going to need, um, you're going to need a physical mask. Yeah, mask. and Prim, I really agree with that. I think the bigger message for healthcare workers, and this is how you know we had this discussion with with staff that I work with in, in the ER. This is universal precautions now, guys. So it's just like the early days of HIV, and by that I mean we need to treat everybody as if they have it. Yeah, that's the way that we're going to stay stay safe. So you know, I was wearing my face shield and my mask and and you know, patients may think it's a little bit odd, but at the end of the day, we, we need to go back to our families. And so yeah. from the bigger thing, treat everybody like they have it. And, and if you do that, you'll be safe. The other thing, what's interesting about the mask, uh, so again, if you ever have these masks, someone has them, blue side out, white side in, okay? Uh, make sure to put it over your ears and everything. But what's interesting is, this is not just, the, the way this works, it doesn't just prevent you from inhaling um, the respiratory droplets. But the main way this prevents other, uh, uh, main way this really works is from you to prevent you from actually putting out respiratory droplets to other people. So when you have this over your face, it prevents you from coughing and sneezing and transmitting the virus that way. So that's how it, uh, one of the real good benefits of, of surgical masks. Let's see here. Uh, hello, sir. FSGS, are they at high risk for the coronavirus? FSGS. So people with kidney disease generally, depending on your kidney function, are um are at higher risk okay people with kidney disease definitely are at higher risk now depending on where your kidney disease is at right your gfr your percentage of kidney function that's going to that's going to correlate to how more how much more you're at risk also if you have fsgs and you're on immunosuppressive medication like a prednisone or something like that definitely man it, it can do that so you got to be extra cautious um let's see here javier Aces, oh this is the one you talked about right yeah javier i think we asked you a question about aces and aces and uh what's NSAIDs. It, NSAIDs, right let's yeah. take a question so prem you are not you don't have a small brain so prem says i know COVID 19 is droplet but why are we on airborne precautions because the virus is not does not originate from lungs but down to lungs 
the virus is super confusing to my to, to my small brain. So from your your logic is actually very sound, right? Yeah. So like, why are we on airborne precautions if it's if it's um, uh, droplet borne? So point being is this is that um, there are some studies that indicate so like with their, there was like a princess cruise where the the cruise uh, 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 participants had gotten sick. Um, there's still the the the, the firm belief or the the balance of evidence is still saying that that this is respiratory droplet. Um, however, there were viral particles found on surfaces for up to 14 days after they vacated the area. Also, three to four hours, um, once again, viral particles in the air. Now, it's important to differentiate, though, between viral particles and actual viruses that are able to kind of convey disease. And so the thing that I will say right now is that I think that there's enough of a gray area, there's enough of a question about whether or not these viral particles are, are, are enough to infect, and that's why we ha also have airborne precautions. And, you know, once again, um, I don't think it's ever unreasonable to have an abundance of caution. Abundance yeah. of caution, you can never go wrong. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And again, that's that's the big thing. Everyone thinks it's just a respiratory droplets kicking out. You have to be careful because when they cough, it goes on the table. It goes on different surfaces. So you have to be careful. That's where the washing the hands comes in. I don't mean to reinforce that point, but I mean to reinforce that point, okay? If you're all out there, I see you all out there, please hit up that like button so we can see you guys. Please let us know you're out there and leave a question. Let's see here. Megan, someone's got something in Spanish. I can't get the Spanish. Yeah. Megan. <laughs> so, Lupita, podemos hacer este otro día, ¿ok? Podemos hacer una, una sesión para las, las personas que, que hablan español. Uh, podemos hacerlo otro día, porque sí es importante para todo el mundo para saber lo que, lo que está pasando, ¿ok? So, we'll do another session. Um, well, I'll definitely do another session in Spanish um, because, yeah, it's important. She was just saying, you know, she wants to get some information in Spanish. So, sí. Um, para, la, para la gente que, que no habla eh, inglés, podemos hacerlo, ¿ok? Also, you can probably make the website in Spanish, too. I have a little sí. Spanish website. I just yeah. gave her an idea. Right. I just gave her an idea. Then, see. <laughs> All right. I would like other people having it. Let's see here. Margaret, Marianne, kind of piggybacking off the, uh, the question about reinfection, what about likelihood that people have already had COVID-19 before it blew up in March? You are yeah. absolutely right. There's probably a lot of asymptomatic carriers if you're healthy. There may have been some young people carrying it, um, and so yeah, you're a absolutely right. Um, can they get reinfected though? I don't think they would get reinfected. You'll have the antibodies, so you shouldn't be able to get reinfected. Again, this is an ongoing virus, an ongoing dynamic situation. So as of right now, the thought process is no. Uh, let's see. So here. Javier Baraja shared something interesting. I didn't know this. So Plaquenil's prevention, there is evidence for it apparently. And Javier, I think he shared earlier, he's internal medicine, so those are the the big brain people. So I believe him. Uh, Plaquenil as prevention, it comes from studies from India where it was used in the Chikagunga uh, virus with modest results. And so once again, guys, this is using, and this is what we do in medicine, right? So there's a particular disease that's similar, and so we can assume that it, it may have uh, similar effects in, in, in coronavirus. Um, so thank you, uh, Dr. Barajas, for sharing that information. Thank you, Dr. Barajas. Appreciate that, man. Um, Kathy Darrow, uh, Dur Dur Kathy, what's up? Kathy. I was told by another ER doc that taking zinc could help prevent symptoms or help recover from the virus. Is that correct? I'll leave that to yeah. you. Absolutely. So um, zinc, there's longstanding evidence for zinc um, uh, being used in viral infections. The key to this, though, is early initiation. And that's what's a little bit more problematic with coronavirus because when were you infected? Because the asymptomatic, you know, cares, it's so common. Um, and actually, um, you know, mean duration, for example, mean duration to progression to ARDS or being very, very sick is actually a week. So it takes a week for patients to feel very, very sick. And so point being, um, the zinc, the evidence for zinc is there. Early initiation is important. Um, and so I think once again, going back to what we discussed earlier, Kathy, do it now if you're consistent with supplementation and you're consistent with a good diet. Well, you yeah. don't have to supplement when you get sick. You're just doing it as a, as a, as a matter of course. Absolutely. And again, what she's talking about when you do take these supplements, I mean, overall general health is just as important as these supplements. So again, what she, to her point, okay? Nikea uh, Layla, hey Nikea, no steroids, uh, cortical steroids either. Yes. So uh, I'm sorry, yeah. uh, was she trying to get? So she, go ahead. I think I think what what she's, she's actually sharing, an NP by the way. She's an NP. So go yeah. ahead. And so what Nicole's sharing is Nicole. Nikea, Nikea. Nikea. So what she's sharing is is absolutely true, and I appreciate you sharing this. So basically, what we're seeing is that um, in COVID uh, pneumonia, yeah. Injections with steroids can actually exacerbate it. And so in the ER, we're just kind of having to exercise caution in giving steroids because you don't want to obviously exacerbate the pneumonia. Oh, so okay. good point. Um, I think it's important for patients to, to be aware. 
yeah, steroids should not be given if you have a suspicion of COVID. Okay. Uh, many, many again, when we, when we hear an infected individual may have been at public place, should we avoid that place for a certain amount of time? How long does it live on services? That's a good question. That's a very good question. Thanks, many. Go ahead. You want to yeah. So, so once again, guys, viruses are not very hardy. Mm -hmm. um, there's evidence of viral particles remaining on surfaces for three to four hours. Um, but the cool thing about viruses is that they're very unstable in UV light. Um, you know, they're very unstable just hanging out in the world. And so three to four hours is, is kind of the textbook answer. But once again, that's for viral particles, which may not even be able to convey disease. Um, so yeah, they're not very hardy on surfaces, which is not to say, um, I still, you know, wiping surfaces is super important, but um, three to four hours is, is the answer. Okay, let's see here. Zinc, how much zinc should be taken during this pandemic? Is there a particular dosage, by the way, or not? So this is from my twin cousin, who I love very much, Ms. <laughs> Milik. Um, so with the um, recommended daily allowance of zinc, um, I cannot lie, eight milligrams. The recommended daily allowance for females is eight milligrams and 11 milligrams per day males. Okay. So those are the, the nutritional guidelines for that. Okay, Deanna Harris, this is a good question. I think you probably better ask it. How long does the virus live in the air or on surfaces? I remember hearing a certain amount on like plastics or metals and stuff like that. Yeah, so, um, and you know, I can't, I, I don't, I, I like to, to be able to, to say definitively, I don't know the, the, the duration of time that it sticks on different surfaces. Um, but once again, point being is that, that three to four hours is the duration that you're looking at um, for, I don't know what surface that was on, but um, once again, if you wipe it with a EPA approved uh, substance, bleach um, is EPA approved, um, aerosol, aerosolized peroxide, um, uh, high, uh, concentration alcohol, all of those things will kill the, the virus on contact. So those are all good options. Okay. Uh, and most household cleaners will do it, right? Will. Most Absolutely. household cleaners will do it. You don't have to go all fancy, get commercial grade no. stuff, ruin your furniture. You can just get the standard kind of stuff and it'll kill it, okay? Um, Brittany Dew. Brittany Dew is a great girl. She received a renal transplant recently. Congratulations. And she asked a very good interesting question. How do you cope during this time as a dialysis patient and a transplant? Well, that's a good question. Um, now, you again, we've talked about this. Dialysis patients and even transplant and transplant, transplant have to be extra cautious. So they're not regular people. Uh, as far as coping, uh, you know, that's an interesting question. I mean, like, are there? Uh, I would imagine there could be support groups for this. You know, I'm a big fan in dialysis units of actually having support groups for people within there. You know, this may be a time for that. Unfortunately, you can't gather. Right. So this is right. such a this is such a weird disease, right, guys? This is so weird. We want to help. We want to do things, but the best way to social interact is actually see each other. Unfortunately, FaceTime. Oh, you have to talk about Face Zoom, Zoom all Skype, great yep. Um, maybe even Facebook groups. Maybe even set up your own Facebook group. You know, and uh, just talk about your your issue problem. I happen to work with the Texas Kidney Foundation, by the way. Big shout out to Texas Kidney Foundation. They have groups set up, so maybe they can, they had physical groups, so maybe in this time they can actually set up groups like this um, as well if you all are out there, okay? So guys, a couple other things, especially for the healthcare providers, because I know there's a lot of healthcare providers that are listening. Um, there is a platform, and of course it just left me. There's a platform for meditation. Pepper, if you're listening, you know who it is. It's a meditation platform that, that they're giving to healthcare workers for free. Um, but there's a lot of good kind of, um, oh, okay. Look up oh sorry, yeah. there's, there's a lot of, uh, uh, good resources, um, for mental health in the home. Um, so just talk, um, better, uh, I'm sorry guys, I will post a link for, uh, for kind of online, uh, mental health resources. Um, but yeah. It's definitely a challenge. And you, she could, she's going to be updating COVID SA all the time. So that kind of stuff will be up there as well, too. Okay. Maybe we can even do a dialysis thing on there. Yeah. Too. Maybe, yeah. right? Uh, let's see here. Prem. My, my girl Prem is asking all these intelligent questions. I know. Did you, did you answer this one? COVID-19 is a droplet. But why yes, are we? Well, answer you already answered it. <laughs> Sorry, Prem. Yeah. Uh, and thanks for letting us know you don't want to die, Prem. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, how? Okay. Oh, this is an interesting question. How true is it about the people with blood type A are more likely to catch the coronavirus? Is that true at all? Is that I have to tell you guys, I, there's no evidence that I'm aware of. Um, maybe if some of the other physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses on on the the um, on this 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 call, if they, if they can put in. But 
no, that I'm aware of, there's there's really no reason that I can think of pathophysiologically why there would be any difference. So no, yeah. not that I'm aware. Amy Rochelle, RN, uh, great to have a nurse on here. What are the thoughts on the doctor on on the doctor that was fired for speaking out about the lack of PPE? That was in Washington, I believe, yeah, right? It was. So this is a, a hard situation to be in. Now, as a doctor, you want the PPE there. Now, the thing is, I hate Monday morning quarterbacking the situation. I don't know. I'm not there. But at the same time, you know, you're when you're we're, we're fortunate right now. We're in Texas, so it hasn't hit us that bad. Just so you know, there's about 229 cases in Bear County at this point. Only about five or six deaths. That's not that bad. So we're coping pretty well here. Um, but 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 we're, yeah yeah. So far, so right. far, meaning we haven't hit our peak. And I, yeah. you're you're right. I'm sorry. I don't I don't want to reinforce that we're fine. Mm -hmm. But we're not in that situation. Hopefully not yet. Right. So in Washington, if you're running out of PPE, what do you do? You know, you're not getting it. Uh, where are you going to get the supplies? Um, you know, that's terrible that they spoke out about it. But again, I didn't read it that in detail about the whole scenario. But yeah, if you did, so, comment so to it. So basically what happened, um, my understanding was that he wore his own PPE and then he was told that he couldn't wear his own PPE. And he was like, this is ridiculous. You guys aren't supplying it. I should be able to wear it. Oh, okay. Um, Go ahead. But I think the take home for, for our audience is that really they need to understand that those are work essential items that we need. Um, and so, you know, doing a run in the store, and this has already occurred, but if you have, um, if you have supplies, you know, masks, it's the people on the front line that really need it. Okay. Um, and so the point that I'm making is that, um, and I guess really the other thing with that is that, that we got in this business to help people. Um, but yeah, working without PPE, it's, it's, it's hard. And this is the interesting, PPE is pro uh, uh, personal protective equipment, okay? Um, what's interesting is um, I work with Methodist Hospital. Diana Henderson is on here. I'm actually well, the chairman of medicine there. And we were actually talking about recycling or reusing PPE, masks and things like that, reusing or having reuse protocols. So this is kind of a scary scenario for all of us. We yes. haven't done that yet. And luckily we're getting more supplies, but this is the, that's, this is the kind of scary scenario you're in. Um, Jennifer Johnson, if you have, the, have to get the virus post-transplant, will it destroy your transplant kidney? Okay, so this is, a, this is a very interesting question. So from what I understand as far as uh, uh, COVID-19 COVID and your kidney, COVID-19 doesn't, uh, it can't, oh, there's kind of mixed data right now, but five to 10% of people that get COVID-19 have acute kidney injury, I mean injury to the kidney. Now that injury may not be directly the virus attacking the kidney, it may be the overall condition of your body deteriorating, and when that happens, your kidney is going to go and shut down, and that's what can happen, okay? Now, there is some evidence that maybe it causes a little levels of protein and blood in the urine. That's a possibility. Now, to your point about the post-transplant. Now, if you're immediately post-transplant, you're in a scarier phase, okay? Because immediately after transplant, you're on very high doses of the, of the immunosuppressive medication, okay? Over the, the year or two, you're at lower doses, so you're less, less likely affected. So um, are, am I at risk for losing the transplant? you're at risk for getting very very sick how's about that okay mm -hmm. so immediately post your very very uh very uh, very high risk okay so guys real quick i just want to say um you know if you have a question there's never <laughs> there's never a dumb question my friend jessica would probably argue that there might be such thing as a dumb question but there's never a dumb question yeah um please ask it um we're here and 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 this is this is our mission. We want to educate. So please don't hesitate in asking your question. I absolutely, I'm really good at dumb questions. So please feel free to send them my way. All right. The intelligent ones is when I struggle with. Okay. Let's see here. Let's see here. Uh, oh my God. Elderberry. So Angela Peppa, shout out to Peppa. Um, she says, I've heard elderberry is not recommended for COVID-19, even though it has been known to be effective for other viruses, such as influenza. Would you please explain why? So this has to do with cytokines, guys. So basically, when you have uh, a uh, infection, inflammatory markers will increase. So apparently, the elderberry will increase these types of cytokines, which are pro-inflammatory, which kind of exacerbate things like pneumonia infection. And so that's the thought about why elderberry um, will, will worsen um, COVID infections. Um, so yeah, that's that's why that's why pepper. Okay. Um, Javier Barajas, Hi, again, again, a very intelligent commentary here, man. CDC most likely to say yes to masks for everyone, assuming no shortage for healthcare workers. He is right. They are kind of switching the, switching the, the game on this one, okay? So for the most part, the CDC and the World Health Organization have come out against surgical masks for everyone. But there is some data coming out of uh, Asia that it is effective 
at trans, uh, uh, stopping the virus from transmitting air, as far as respiratory droplets. So there is that. And for what I'm reading now online, uh, online from CNN, different sources, they, they are most likely to recommend um, uh, a cloth mask that you make at home. And eventually, pro they may ask you to recommend a surgical mask. And the surgical mask, again, the, the logic is you're in a big city like Hong Kong. It prevents you from coughing or spewing out stuff and sending it out. So again, the asymptomatic carriers, the people that don't have any symptoms, they may be spewing out stuff. And so it prevents that, okay? That don't mean that everyone go out there and get surgical masks, okay? Yeah. You may want to start with the home mask. Right. We're going to see what the CDC recommends. Maybe tomorrow or later this week, they're going to actually recommend something. And I agree with that to, to just... Um... Yeah, that for right now, the, don't don't run out and get the surgical masks, even if it, if it looks like they're kind of yeah. um, going in that direction. Um, oh, my dad's here. Dad, hi, dad. So what uh, is the lifespan <laughs> of virus germs when on hands and when on doorknobs? Doorknobs. So that's metal. What are we talking? Four hours kind of thing? Yeah, is that right? That's that's my understanding. I think that there's differences oh, in it, surfaces, guys. I, I think apologize. it depends on the surface. Yeah, and this is something you can actually look up. Unfortunately, there's a lot of Facebook memes about that one, too. Uh, but there are different... Um, uh, there are different life it has a longer lifespan on different surfaces. Sorry, Dad, I'll I'll text you that one later, Dad. Okay, let's see here. Um, That's a really good question. Now there's now they're saying so De Deanna Harris. They're saying they're saying now that it can be spread by non-symptomatic persons by just them through speaking. Yes, I heard that earlier on CNN today. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, the, the problem with this virus, guys, it is uber contagious. Mm -hmm. It is just so contagious. Yeah. And that's the main problem. It's not, not just the death rate, but it, it just affects so many people at such a quick time that it overwhelms the hospital system. Okay? So, guys, the, the term that we use for, for contagious factor is something called R0. Um, and R0 is zero is kind of baseline, kind of what the typical common cold would be. This is two to three times. The R0 of, the, of COVID is two to three times um, that of a typical virus. And so it's, it's, a, it's a really big deal. Okay. A uh, Ruby but my aunt, how are you doing? Which mask is good? Can we use fabric masks like home mask? I would start with the homemade mask because I think you're going to have a hard time getting a surgical mask anyway. Mm -hmm. So I would start with the homemade mask. Again, a homemade sur a fabric mask is about 30 to 50% as effective as a surgical mask. Okay. Um, let's see here. Yvonne Gu uh, Gutierrez Garcia, do you recommend any special precaution to someone who is diabetic with asthma and in their 50s? I'll, I'll yeah. give you that one. Go so ahead. So guys, really easy. Once again, the, the answer is stay home. Um, the bigger deal with this is that as we look at kind of the comorbidities have, that have the biggest impact on uh, mortality as it relates to, to getting COVID. So what are people, what are the diseases that people that get COVID are dying with? So point being is that people with cardiovascular disease, that's the number one kind of risk factor in terms of, of kind of co-prognosis with, with uh, COVID. Um, but really all of those, um, diabetes, cancer. Um, so point being is that, that if you have those comorbidities, stay home. If you stay home, you stay alive. Mm -hmm. um, it should make a hashtag, right? You heard it here first, stay yeah. home, stay alive. Oh, uh, real quick, uh, Genevieve Panita, I don't know if you answered this question. Uh, not sure if this has been asked already, but is there a second wave in the future that is expected? That's yeah. a good question. Um, so what's interesting is in China, what they've done is essentially because they have a, an, a kind of an authoritarian regime there, they're able to put 900 million people in shelter. So they have them in lock. Now they're starting to let them out. So we're gonna see if by keeping people at home, and the, and the, the coronavirus is still exposed, if there's a second wave possible. And that, that is a possibility. But again, what the, what the whole thing is, is to, flatten the curve right we don't want to have a spike of everyone getting it and come down we want to have it kind of gradually done over time right. so there could be a second wave but hopefully by that time we've discovered that some medications have treated by that time we discover we're not overwhelming our hospital system so go ahead yeah and and jenny so the the other thing with that is that the the really the the closest model that we have for this or a pretty appropriate model would be the the spanish flu the spanish um epidemic in 1918 and if that's if that's an accurate model, it was actually the second wave that was more deadly. Is that right? Yeah. Really? And so, um, people got false sense of security, maybe. Absolutely. Moving yeah. out, um, had not been exposed, and then ended up getting sick. And so, unfortunately, we probably will see a bimodal um, kind of occurrence. Yeah. Um, it's just, it is what it is. There's a lot of things in the works, though, that are, that are very promising. A lot of the medications that were used in Ebola, mm -hmm. um, there's a, an HIV drug that's not showing as much promise. Um, but yeah, the hope is that, and, and that's another unfortunate thing with vaccination, best case scenario, guys, a vaccine will be available next year. And so it's not really uh, likely 
going to be something that's going to make a big difference for this year. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, Jenny, to answer your question, unfortunately, yeah, we're probably looking at a bimodal uh, at, at a second second wave. And Deanna Harris has commented that Hong Kong just had its second wave. I, I, I'm not sure of that, I, I don't, but that's what she said. Thanks for letting us know about that, though. Uh, melatonin, do you ask that question about melatonin? No? Mm -hmm. I, uh, Esme Escobedo, uh, I remember hearing about melatonin likely benefits re reduce the force of COVID-19. I have not heard such a thing. Mm -hmm. Have you or no? No, um, as I said, once again, I'll, I'll do some reading on that. I, I, that's not something that I've heard. And honestly, I can't think of why that would have an impact. But um, certainly, once again, um, you know, I'll make sure to, uh, I'll make sure to, to answer that question um, on the website. Um, if that's, yeah. Ronnie Beren, Ber Ronnie, um, he, he answers the questions that hit kind of to home to us. What precautionary member measures if, uh, if you're staying home, but your spouse mm -hmm. or family members are essential employees and have to leave home daily, that's a really good question because my wife and three daughters are those people mm -hmm. and her husband and, and how many kids? Yes. three kids mm -hmm. are the same, in the same boat. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be extra cautious. So what I do when I get home, I'm always wearing scrubs to work. Okay. So I, I literally take off my shoes outside the house. Don't let them in. I go straight into my bathroom and take a shower. So that's what I do. Um, I've kind of avoided, to be honest with you, kissing my kids as much. I, I hug to some degree, but I keep my face away from them. Yeah. I'm being extra cautious. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what data there is to support it, but mm -hmm. I'm just being extra cautious. What about you? So guys, I'm smiling because if anybody who knows me knows how much I love, um, my, I, I know you love your kids. Everybody loves their kids, right? But I just love like loving on them. And so point being, I love squeezing the crap out of them until yes. I say, daddy, stop. Yes. So I'm yes. in that boat. I'm yeah, in that boat. Force, force loving. Force, force loving. loving. <laughs> daddy, no, no. <laughs> it's not Me love too. until it hurts. Yeah. <laughs> but go ahead. Go ahead. So point being with that is you're correct. Yeah. And it's hard um, because we should be minimizing contact with the little ones. We should um, literally, I think somebody made this comment, um, Sonia. Yeah, absolutely, Sonia. Like I maybe a little overshare. I strip down in the garage. Everything comes off in the garage. Um, all the clothes in the washer, put that on hot and go upstairs and, and, and take a shower. Wash my hair, make sure that, that everything's out. Um, to me, I don't think that you can ever be too careful. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen my dad. My dad's 80 years old. Um, he has COPD. I haven't seen him. I've seen him through the window. Um, just saw him this morning through the window, but I, I don't go to him. And, and so these are hard decisions, guys. You know, that little person that you love so much that you want to hug on. But no, absolutely. Abundance of caution, like I said, is, is the key word in all of this. Absolutely. Angela Pepper, melatonin may be helpful because it sleep, makes you sleep better. Therefore, the rest is actually helpful. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, uh, again, we're, we're about health and wellness. Sleep is crucial. People do not understand that. Sleep is crucial. So yeah. getting your 78 hours every night is crucial. Perhaps that could be a benefit of melatonin. I'm not, I'm not advocating melatonin, but mm -hmm. I'm just saying there. Uh, Pram, 100 patients per day in Thailand, but prefer to not... What is it? But prefer to no saying much. Uh, don't want to get in trouble. 100 patients per day. I'm not sure what you're getting oh, at. I think, Prim, so what, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I think she's saying is that there has been some women in data coming from certain countries. Yeah. Maybe. Because um, I know China for sure has been under reporting, reporting their cases. Um, and that, that's a true thing about China. I don't think we can really trust what's coming out. It is a totalitarian regime, and so they're not going to let out data that, that makes them look bad. Technically, the United States overpassed China as the number one um, as the number one uh, cases in the world. We have over two hundred twenty thousand at this point in the United yeah, States, so two hundred twenty five thousand deaths. So we over overtook them. Yeah. But again, some of the data out of China, I don't know how, how how much we can trust sometimes. Well, and two, they have more of an ability to shut things down. Yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely, government. absolutely. Um, let's see, Jennifer, being post transfer, shouldn't I qualify for short term disability through my employer? Since they say my job is essential, I don't feel comfortable at work at all but i need my health insurance so what i would say is jennifer i've been uh, giving out notices to my patients saying um, because they're a transplant patient or immunocompromised that they need to be able to work from home so i'm not sure about the short term disability what qualifies you, you may want to talk to a, a social worker case manager kind of person or maybe even your transplant center about that maybe they have a case manager that can help you out but i have been getting giving out letters to my patients that i think should be working from home okay so great question there hey minnie you are so sweet Thank you. Oh, she's a peep. That's oh. all I'm gonna say. Oh, okay. Oh, she said you were pretty. That's why. Okay. <laughs> Abby Haran, there is going. Doctor Bud is going to run outside safe as long as I stay away from people, and of course wash my hands out. Don't touch my face. Yeah, absolutely. 
going for a run. Oh, run, run. You mean run? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I would encourage people to run. Just stay your distance away from other runners. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a great idea. You don't want to be bored to death at home. Yeah, good for your mental health, good for your physical health. Um, I can't lie and say I haven't worked out for, for 10 days now, but yeah, definitely a good move, guys, um, running outside. Also, Nikaya, this study regarding this, the correlation between blood type and COVID-19 is out of China. It was one study and not been peer-reviewed. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you, you Nikaya. I really that. appreciate that one. That actually really helped. I was not aware of that. Um, you know, again, this is an evolving thing. This is a fluid situation. We are learning about this virus as we go. So I don't want you to think doctors or the CDC or the government is just doing, don't know what they're doing. We're learning about it every week. And to be honest with you guys, you're listening to us now, but you got to rethink this stuff. Maybe they revisit it in a week. So every week, get your little update about math, about precautions, about treatments, all that kind of stuff. Because what we say could be outdated just in a few days. Okay. Yeah. And Nikia, thank you for sharing that because it's interesting. It actually has a really strong end. It's 2,000 patients. So. Oh, there, really? There might be something to it, guys. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. There was a question, Jessica Howell, RN, she had a question about, oh, uh, coronavirus antibody testing is, I believe, what she was referring to. Um, the coronavirus antibody testing is a really interesting proposition. When you read the package insert, guys, it does not distinguish between types of coronavirus. Oh. And so. Really? Mm hmm And so I think it's going to be problematic. I, I don't know if this is something that's been resolved. But um, I'm going to say it was two days ago um, that, that I was looking at this. So, yeah, it's, it's problematic. Cause, I mean, so just so you know, guys, I, I kind of touched this on the beginning of, of the show, but coronavirus is um, the common cold. Mm. And so antibody testing for the common cold may not be able, or for coronavirus in general, may not be able to differentiate between coronavirus 19 versus just the common cold. So this may be an issue. Um, Maybe an issue, yeah, absolutely. Jessica, how, a good question. Are hospitals allowing us to wear your own respirators? I am not sure of that. I don't think so. So Jessica's just asking this for the crowd because Jessica's going to do what she wants to do, which uh, I think is not a bad idea. Um, I uh, have a respirator, guys. I'm wearing my respirator. You're wearing N95? No, I'm oh, wearing, no, no. I have, I have a, a respirator. So oh. patients that are high risk, I actually have a respirator, a multi-use respirator. Oh, okay. And, and so guys, in the ER, um, and once again, you have to do what you feel comfortable with, but in the ER, especially for high risk patients. Um, I use the N95 for patients that, that are by history, at least lower risk, but for patients that are higher risk, I have a respirator. I have a full face shield. Um, reason being, once again, you can never be too safe. Um, yeah. The N95 may not be sealing completely. And with the respirator, um, I had a fit test and I know that fits right. So, mm -hmm. so guys kind of circling back to the Washington, um, uh, to the Washington, um, gentleman that was, that was fired. We have a mission to serve, and I think that's what we've been called to do, but we certainly haven't been called to serve and um, put our own lives and families at risk. So Yeah, so honestly, I got this one right here. If I need to, I'll, I'm bringing it to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And when the crap hits the fan, to be honest with you, I'm bringing in my own stuff if I have it. Yep. So I'm not sure what the policy is, but to be honest with you, I don't think any, any administrators I know in the hospitals I go to would ever stop me if that were there. Deanna Harris, this is something you can see because she's ex-military here. A naval commander was relieved of his duty for sounding the alarm for needing help on his ship. And I think this is the ship off of Guam, right? The air, the aircraft carrier. You heard of this one? There's an aircraft carrier off of Guam where seven of the sailors are actually infected with coronavirus and they want to be bored. Um, I'm not in the military and I've heard, I've just read this on the BBC. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure how the military works, but I'm pretty sure they don't want to let them, let the general public know about stuff like that, right? Yeah, and you know, the right thing's the right thing. That's all, the right thing is always the right thing. That's all I'll say about that, Yeah. you know? Okay, you, uh... Oh, Dr. Barajas, this is reality. So it was weird. I had a patient that I saw for bronchitis and I got a phone call back asking specifically for um, the indication for prescribing azithromycin. So he says, regarding Plaquenil, the, the pharmacy board is checking on every new prescription. Indeed they are. Um, there has to be an indication that is either um, hospital-based yeah. or um, that is actually, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. And I think it's great because um, these patients, they need their medication. And if, if people are hoarding medication that they don't need, the people that, that need it won't be able to get it. So, yes, Dr. Borjas, they are absolutely doing that. Awesome, awesome. 
So um, let's see here, guys. Uh, well, last one. Uh, let's see. Brittany Dew, she was the one who got a transplant. You have a Zoom support group every day. That's amazing. That's amazing, uh, okay. Brittany. Great, great. Um, let's see here. Any other questions here? Because we're going on an hour now. We don't want to take up too much of your time at this point because we've asked a lot of questions here. The best use of say, uh, uh, do you all know if taking airborne every day is safe? What does that mean? Taking airborne? Yeah, so airborne is a zinc, um, a zinc containing uh, over the counter product. Um, it's funny because Angela Pepper, who's a nurse that I work with, she just looked up the concentration of zinc um, in airborne. Um, let me look it up real quickly and make sure that it's not in excess of the recommended daily allowance. Zinc, um, unlike vitamin C, vitamin C is uh, water soluble. Vitamins D and E are fat soluble, meaning that C you could take in your body, at least theoretically, if your kidneys are functioning properly, your body would be able to eliminate it. D, E, A, and K, and zinc, your body cannot eliminate if you're taking ex excessive amounts. Yeah. So um, I will have the answer in just a moment. I'm looking up the ingredients. Um, what I would say is this, actually. Zinc, eight milligrams of zinc, 11 milligrams if you're a male, and, and be done with it. Because I, I imagine that the, the, the emergent, or the airborne, um, it's just a combination, uh, to my rec recollection, it's just a combination of vitamin C and zinc. So mm -hmm. just get, get them independently in your vitamin and you'll get to, you're good to go. Okay, guys, uh, we've been here for an hour or so. Do me a favor right now. If you want us to do this again, let us know again in the comment section. But also like, like, like right now. Share, share, share. I want you to all get it out there. Also tag people in the comment section you think they need to see this, okay? Because I think we hit a lot of good topics today, okay? Um, but we've been here for about an hour. I think we did a really good job. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, I'm or whatever. Yeah, speak no, for myself. No, 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 good, of, good job, you. Yeah. No, no, I think so. I, my my face is that that there's so many things that are going on that are interesting that that, that you know yeah. I want to share, and I'm sure that that people have have questions. Um, but yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Awesome, and thank you. I told y'all she was awesome, guys. I told y'all she was awesome. Megan Williams, Dr. Megan Williams. Okay, guys, we're gonna let you go right now. Thank you, guys, for tuning in. Uh, and remember, it's your kidneys, your health, like and share, like and share, guys, okay?